we will continue uh, with Dr. Jane Vresnik. When preparing this meeting today, she smiled at me broadly. Well, she made me smile rather with a sentence she didn't even say when we spoke, but a sentence she twittered. It's her motto, obsessed with metabolism really obsessed. That was on her Twitter account. If you look at her account, oftentimes uh, people say art would not be based on something that you can do, but something that you have to do. Artists have this obsession with art, but Jane Resnick apparently has an obsession as well, and that is an obsession for metabolism. In order to research that, she has um, chosen partners which are amazing, naked mole rats. And the connection between naked mole rats and our age, my age and her aging research, you will learn from her directly. If you want to listen to the simultaneously translation in German, please pull in your earphones, Jane Resnick, the stage is yours. Hello, can everyone hear me? Oh, ah, okay. oh, yes, that's better. That's better. <laughs> so, um, let's see. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I have to say this is also a very fascinating day for me because I get to step outside of my molecular world and get to find out other people's perspective around this topic and of course then bring it back to the research that I do. So my question that I was given to present to you today is die young at an old age. And I thought the animal that I research the naked mora, which you see here on the, on the picture, I will just try and, I don't know, um, ooh. Is, is very appropriate for this uh, particular question because I think this animal really provides the proof of concept that we can indeed die young at an old age. And I will um, talk a little bit about this animal throughout my talk. Um, but to start with, I would like to, um, explain what we actually are trying to do as researchers in the aging field. And you can see here by this graph, um, what is happening is as we get older, our health starts to decline. And with health, what I mean is our mind starts to decline in, term, in terms of our short-term um, memory, starts to sort of uh, fail us, executive function and the processing speed that, we're, that we do everything also starts to slow down. In terms of our body, we start to lose muscle mass, which is extremely important to stay healthy. Um, we sort of lose functional movement, so it's more difficult for us to bend down, go up the stairs and so on. Um, and we also start to experience more and more pain. And of course, then there is the manifestation of certain chronic diseases, and Torsten mentioned these, um, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and neu neurodegenerative diseases. And so um, what is interesting is we start to, as, as normal people that normally age, uh, which is unfortunately most of us here, um, you will start to see these, um, these things start to go down at around age 60, and this is when you usually go to the doctor and start to get uh, certain medicine. What is happening in the body, however, is that at age 40 or so on, some of the factors that will, um, by the time you're 60, start to impact this, this is already happening in your 40s. However, you can see that around the age 40 is when we're feeling quite fit still, and so it is actually quite important to start thinking about these things if you want to live for a longer time, even um, at a young age of 30 and 40, because these things eventually do impact on how you age. Um, what you can see also from this curve is that uh, the rate at which we sort of start to um, decline in health starts to increase from about 60 years old. And so we're spending um, from about 60 to 80 um, sort of declining in our health faster and faster, and we're spending then 
around 20 years uh, in sort of poor health, uh, having to take medicine and not living the best lives that we can possibly live. And so what we're trying to do um, as aging researchers is not only we're trying to prolong the actual life, and one can argue whether this is uh, important or not, but what we're actually trying to do is to decrease the rate of um, decline so, so that you can live your life uh, more healthy and in a fitter and happier way for longer, and to sort of compress this morbidity uh, time so that you don't spend so much time sick. Um, and how we want to do this is, oh, sorry. Um, can't really work out how to use this. Okay, so um, what, so what we're trying to do is, is to work out, is this sort of aging process um, avoidable? And it turns out that this aging process is biological and uh, the correlates that makes us age can be intervened with. And how do we know this? We have certain clues from the natural world. And I will begin with humans, because we're humans. So there are centenarians, so people that can live longer than the average 80 years or so. They can live um, 100 years or even longer. And these provide us with um, examples to research what is in these people that allow them to live for such a long time. Um, so this is an example of such a person, Irving Kahn, he is trading um, at, in Wall Street um, at the age of 100 or older, and he has all his sort of uh, cognitive functions with him, and he's able to do this, and is celebrating his 106th birthday. Then you have, um, from, the, from the natural world, we have uh, different sort of animals. Um, so the famous naked morat, which I research, which uh, lives for over 30 years Old and this animal, um, because of its size, would be expected to live about three years, but it's living ten times longer. And so there's something about its biology that is allowing it to live for such a long time. Then there are other animals that are actually uh, short-lived. And so an example is the, the um, African killifish. And this animal lives a very short uh, lifespan compared to other species of similar size and environment. And here we can research what makes this uh, animal age at an accelerated rate and therefore find out the correlates that are important for this. And in the lab, what we were able to do, and Torsten already mentioned this, is to actually start knocking out particular genes or introducing particular genes which allow these animals to either live longer or shorter. And so you can see here, these two mice are the same age, but because of their particular um, manipulations that the researchers did with their genomes, uh, one is looking very old, whereas the other one is looking very young. And the same goes for these two fish. They're the same age, but because one gene is missing from these animals, this animal is aging much faster. And so these are basically the, the traits that we already know in our bodies that are responsible for aging. Oh, again. <laughs> Okay, oh, I'm sorry, I'm somehow. Okay, so what can we learn about um, centenarians? So first of all, what we know is they actually die from the very same diseases that we all die from. So uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer, um, followed by cancer, neurodegenerative disease, and, and these people will also get the same diseases. However, they will get them later in life, so we will usually, as I mentioned, get them when we're 60. They usually get them at 80 or between 80 and, and 98 years old. And they don't suffer from these diseases very much. Um, and because they get it towards the end of their uh, lifespan, their morbidity is shortened. The other thing that we know is that the, the um, this, how long you will live is predominantly determined by your genes. And so this is maybe a little bit unfortunate because the genes that you get is the genes that uh, you can't really do anything about it. So these are the cards that you're dealt. Um, however, we know this because, well, first of all, uh, when we sort of start to sequ sequence them on someone, we see certain genes appear more in these populations than um, in the populations of normally aging people. But we also know from their children that the, their children are also less likely to um, get cancer or other sort of diseases, which means that they have passed on these genes to their children as well. And so, um, 
what can then the animal world teach us about uh, longevity? And so I don't know if, you, if you're aware of this, but sort of the bigger you are, the, more, um, the, the longer that you live as an animal. But however, there are some animals that sort of fall outside of this curve. So the normal curve is an elephant big, lives for a long time. The, I don't know, a mouse is small, lives for only two to three years. Um, but some animals fall outside of this curve, and that's including the naked mole rat, which you can see there. Also, some species of bats live a particularly long time, and then there are some animals that live a very short time, like I'm from Australia, so there are marsupials in Australia. These live a very short time, unexpectedly. And so what we can learn from these is um, we can start to compare what kind of traits or genes these animals have to see what is responsible for their longevity. Um, we can also take two very related species of animals. So, for example, uh, the Canadian goose versus the emperor goose. They, they sort of share mostly the same genes, but something makes the Canadian goose live over 20 years and the emperor goose live only six years. So this here we can really determine which factors uh, play in, in, in the longevity of the Canadian goose. Then there are some species with a dramatic um, aging difference that are the same species. So for example, a queen bee will, will live for a longer time than a worker bee. And so this also goes for the naked mole rat, which has the same sort of social structure. The queen mole rat will live for uh, about 10 years longer than the worker mole rat. Um, and so by doing these comparative studies, we can start to understand what uh, genes and traits are important for a long life. Um, and so, although, as I mentioned, we can't really change our genes, what we can try to do is to mimic the phenotype, so the trait that these genes actually uh, code for, um, we can try to mimic that via certain interventions. And the interventions include either a lifestyle intervention or a therapeutic intervention. And so this is sort of our primary focus as researchers. And the picture that is emerging of the pathways that are responsible for um, a long lifespan are those that are um, involved in stress response pathways, so it's sort of responding, uh, allowing your body to respond to um, times of particularly stressful environment, so for example, um, no food or heat, um, things like this. Um, and the other pathway is nutrient uh, sensors. So you know, I'm obsessed with metabolism because metabolism seems to be at the core um, of a long, healthy lifespan. And so you don't have to care about the names of these, which seem a little bit uh, obscure and random to non-scientists, but these, um, there might be more, four pathways seem to be uh, responsible for um, determining lifespan. And so what happens is when there's plenty of food, so when, when um, the environment is not a stressful environment, the insulin pathway and the mTOR pathway that, that um, sort of senses that we have food, that we have protein, that we have uh, sugar, tend to go up and they then turn on particular genes, particular pathways, whereas the other one, the AMPK and the searcher ones are down and all of this combined leads you to, leads the body to support growth and reproduction. Um, when uh, there is no food, so this is a stressful situation, so for example, desert, what happens in the organism is the complete opposite. So the insulin and the mTOR signaling pathway go down, whereas the AMPK and the sirtuin pathways go up. And the, the, this combination of these master regulators um, uh, leads to the organism protecting its cells and maintaining some sort of homeostasis and maintaining the cell function that it already has. And this seems to be actually beneficial in terms of lifespan. So this is what allows you to then repair your cells and to maintain some sort of harmony. Um, and so it turns out that these pathways are also, we're able to intervene with these pathways. So they're, they're not just whatever they are, they are, we can, we can do certain things about it. And what we're trying to do is sort of to switch on a latent program that all of us have 
turn it on in order to promote aging. And if we promote aging, as Torsten also mentioned, it's sort of a common factor, a common driver that drives all of these different diseases. So instead of basically treating heart disease or cancer separately, if we treat the whole aging process, we will then get at all of these diseases and protect us from um, actually getting them. So it's in a way treating the symptom and not the, treating the cause of the disease and not the symptom. And so how can we do this? Well, lifestyle interventions, the most popular one and the, I guess the most effective one at the moment as we know it is caloric restriction. However, uh, we do not at the moment know exactly the best winning protocol for caloric restriction. This can take place in, in different ways. You can either, for example, not eat for three days um, of the week, uh, three days um, out of like uh, a quarter of a year, you can skip um, every second day you're not eating. Some people think that it's even enough to not eat for 16 hours a day, so limit your eating to a very short time. And I think um, all of these different protocols have particular benefits, but what uh, we as a research community have to understand is what exactly these different protocols will um, come up. So, for example, maybe one protocol will allow you to you know, keep your, your blood sugar low, your insulin low, but not, um, not, for example, enhance autophagy, which is a very important uh, process that helps to eliminate certain debris from the body. Maybe you need then a longer time to fast. And the problem with sort of trying to work out exactly what the protocol should be is, of course, calorie restriction is extremely cheap, so no drug company is going to invest a lot of money into trying to work out what the exact protocol is because this is not going to be uh, very profitable for them. But um, there are other researchers that are trying to study, it's just that we can't get a lot of money uh, for big uh, clinical trials. And another thing that is uh, emerging as uh, helpful is dietary restriction, which basically means that a calorie is not a calorie, so a calorie that comes from broccoli is not the same calorie as, come as uh, a calorie from sugar, and sugar seems to be one thing that is extremely toxic to the body, so it, it sort of uh, turns on pathways that you do not want to have. It um, creates a lot of sort of derangements in the body, and uh, so one thing to do for sure is to sort of limit your uh, sugar intake. Some people uh, go into, uh, try to get their ketones up and so on. So there's also different protocols there. Um, if, like Peter said, that he doesn't want to fast, well, there's another way, which is uh, pharmacological therapeutics. And, uh, you know, people are working on these. So... Uh, maybe the most popular ones at the moment is uh, metformin, which has shown... So metformin is a drug that was, is the frontline drug for diabetes, so to lower your blood sugar when you have high blood sugar. Um, but what has been... Um, the idea that has been emerging is that, you know, people with diabetes on metformin seem to be getting, for example, a uh, lower incidence of cancer compared to people that... Are completely healthy. So these are people with diabetes on metformin and actually get a lower incidence of cancer. So this drug has been now pushed forward as potentially uh, also just a longevity drug that it helps to protect uh, the body against other um, diseases related to the aging process. Rapamycin, um, this targets the mTOR signaling pathway, and this has been shown, at least in um, animals and in mice, to be extremely good for uh, ex extending lifespan, and I think is now uh, entering clinical trials. And then there's other um, drugs, like the NAD uh, supplements and so on, that are also entering uh, clinical trials. Um, what for example, the, the NIH the, uh, in America has recognized aging as something that can be intervened with, and so they set up um, an interventions testing program where, they got, where, where they're using um, big studies of mice, and they're using particular mice that sort of help us to um, get there faster. They're genetically heterogeneous, which means they're not all the same, which sometimes is a problem um, in research. And they're testing different compounds, and they're doing 
doing this in three different locations and in large cohorts in order to really fast track identifying some of the compounds that we can then use for clinical trials faster. So there is concerted effort to um, try to identify some pharmacological interventions in this uh, area. And so we have identified, uh, I don't know how many this is, seven or nine, nine um, sort of pathways that seem to be important for aging. And I'm not going to go through them because they're all very complicated, but I wanted to draw your attention to epigenetic alterations because at the moment this seems to be um, a very interesting field. And um, what um, epigenetics bas basically means is, so you have your genes which basically code for particular proteins that do the work in your body. Um, what epigenetics is, is a modification on top of the genes that either switch these on or off. And what seems to, um, so the modifications are here denoted by the little tags on the DNA. And what seems to be the, what seems to be happening is, is that these epigenetic changes, so for example, methylation patterns, which is an epigenetic change, um, seems to be different uh, in aging, so it changes throughout your lifespan, it changes with diseases, and it changes through different uh, lifestyle interventions. And what you can do is, um, so what researchers have done is established an epigenetic or an aging clock. So basically what, you could, what they have shown is, is that if you take a large enough population of people and you look at the patterns of this, epi, of this methylation of, the, of these uh, epigenetic uh, changes, you can predict a person's age. Um, and by doing this, you can establish a, a clock. So for most people, the, chronolog the chronological age is going to coincide with their biological age. However, in some people that are sort of aging either faster or slower, these things are not going to correlate with each other. And the reason why we want to have such a clock is that, first of all, we can predict disease. So if you look at the clock at, at any particular time, we can um, work out, are you aging faster, and is there a certain disease that, uh, that, you, that this epigenetic clock can predict? Um, we can also just basically understand the, the aging process, so what are the, on what genes are these methylation marks? This can potentially tell us what kind of uh, genes are important for the aging process, and this can of course test interventions very easily, so we don't have to do these very long studies to see if a person will actually gain another 10 years, maybe we can even get a glimpse of it straight away by looking at the epigenetic clock after about, uh, let's say, six months after the intervention. So this is a very powerful um, new tool that the researchers have in order to get at these questions. And the, you know, the epigenetic clock has now become a universal epigenetic clock and seems to identify the same sites in uh, 128 different mammalian species, which means that, as I said before, that uh, aging is a sort of conserved process that happens in all animals. And so we can really, by st both studying animals and humans and using all of these tools, start to really understand um, how aging happens as a process in order to intervene in it. And so some uh, progress has been done with, with reversing these epigenetic marks, and so very recently in, in 2020 there was a paper published which er basically erased the epigenetic marks that uh, you get as, a, as an older, well, here, mouse. And by erasing these marks, these uh, mice were able to, these were blind mice, and they were able to have their vision restored. And so this really gives hope that uh, sort of erasing these marks and, and uh, resetting them back to what it was like when um, we're young can actually potentially reverse the aging process. Um, and so just lastly, I'd like to mention the naked mole rats, which I study. These animals um, live in a sort of a bee-like insect um, social structure with a queen. She's the only breeding female, um, and she has um, all these workers around her. 
Uh, the reason why I study them is because they do live for such a long time, and the reason why they seem to live for such a long time is because they have uh, evolved adaptations to the very harsh environment that they live in. So they live in sub-Saharan Africa where there's not very much food. They live underground in colonies of about 300 individuals, so their oxygen is low and the carbon dioxide is high. And because of all of these challenges, they have evolved certain adaptations. And this sort of goes with the theme of um, that particular stresses then um, enhance the pathways that sort of protect the cells. And so these animals probably, not because they wanted to live longer, but just as a, as a byproduct of them having to protect their cells, actually then gained this ability to live for such a long time and to live a, um, a disease-free sort of existence up until they basically die. So no one knows why they die, but they're resistant to cancer. The, their heart continues to pump uh, all the way throughout their long lifespan. The, the female breeds up until she also dies, so she never goes into menopause. And so you can see that this animal is actually a very good model to study um, how we can potentially protect ourselves from, age, from aging and aging-related diseases. And I also uh, chose this picture because these are the concepts that we've been thinking about since at least 1546. And you can see now that with certain advances in technology and so on, but potentially we can find out what is in this swimming pool. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jane Resnick, for this intimate insight in your current research and your very special relationship with some guys we presumably all never will meet in person, the naked mole rats. <laughs>